Welcome back to Mi, Ma- Mi Vaya Mi Vida. I am Juan Carmona. And I am Mariana Luna, and we are your hosts. So um, this episode is going to be a, um, a, a first in a series of episodes that we're going to do that came out of um, a lecture I gave at the Wessico Museum on Civil Rights in the Rio Grande Valley. And so we're, you know, I want to start you know, as in chronological order. Normally, I I would really think to start with indigenous resistance and indigenous people, but I feel that they should have uh, their own series that we'll do uh, at a later time. So what I'm going to go back to is, you know, something that's really making its rounds in the news is, um, as of late, is the existence and of the Underground Railroad going south into Mexico. Now, um, after the Mexican War for Independence, the second president, Vicente Guerrero, was actually of African descent. And he is the one who actually frees the slaves in Mexico, making Mexico a nation, you know, where if you're a slave, you could, you know, literally in the Constitution, if you set foot in Mexico, you were automatically free. So we both got interested in this subject because both of us, both me and Juan, are from Donna. So, um, John Weber, who was from Donna, bought land south of Donna, and he essentially made Donna part of the Underground Railroad, which we all know, or if you don't, the Underground Railroad was a way to transport slaves, American slaves, to freedom. So, this is a very little-known history that we wanted to cover because it is part of our, not only our nation's history, but our town's history. And what it, what is interesting about this history is that not only did Mexico free slaves, it protected them. And so um, uh, I want to read a little bit from uh, Smithsonian Magazine, who quotes Diana Cardenas, who's a descendant of the Jackson family, who um, relates a couple of stories of just, you know, how Mexico reacted to slave catchers going into Mexico to try to take the slaves back. So the story of Manuel Luis del Fierro of Reynosa in the state of Tamaulipas, who was startled awake by screaming on the night of August 20th, 1850. He threw off the covers, grabbed his rifle, and confronted two men in his living room. One was waving a pistol at his wife's maid, a young black woman named Mathilde Hens, who had escaped slavery in Louisiana and made the long, dangerous journey to Mexico and became a valued member of Del Fierro's household. So pointing his rifle at the kidnappers, Del Fierro ordered them to surrender. One got away, but the other... William Cheney of Cheneyville, Louisiana, who claimed Haynes was his property under U.S. law, was arrested by the Reynosa police, imprisoned for nearly a month, and sent home empty-handed. The incident was not unusual. Val Gardner discovered um, she read the correspondence of four councilmen from the Mexican border town of Guerrero who pursued, shot, and killed a slaveholder who had kidnapped a runaway. In 1851, the residents of another village in the state of Coahuila took up arms to stop a slave catcher named Warren Adams from reducting a black family. Months later, the Mexican army posted a sizable force and two artillery pieces on the Rio Grande to prevent a group of 200 Texans from crossing the border to seize runaway slaves. So, you know, this just shows, you know, what a commitment Mexico had to making sure and ensuring um, when African Americans made their way into Mexico, they were free and protected. So this is a really interesting um, history. And so we reached out to Roseanne Baca Garza of the UTRGV CHAPS program, who has produced um, a film and is doing a lot more research into this history. And we reached out to her to do a, conduct an interview and have her d- delve deeper into this history. So let's turn over, turn ourselves over to that interview. Thank you for joining us. You want to introduce yourself and what you do and the work you do and where you're working at? Well, hi, everyone. My name is Roseanne Bachagarza. I am a lecturer of anthropology at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And I am the program manager for the CHAPS program here at UTRGV. Thank you so much. Um, really, my first question is, like, I guess we all came to this in different, you know, from different ways. When did you first hear about this history of the Underground Railroad going south? Well, back in 2008 or 2009, I was, I was asked by the San Juan Economic Development Corporation to write their history book and Arcadia Publishing. Uh, book you may have seen it in the in the stores it's called 
Images of America San Juan. And as I was doing my research for the history of San Juan, I encountered a few regional historians who were part of the Hidalgo County Historical Commission. And they were doing their best to inspire me to look further into this very interesting history. Uh, at the time, uh, the book I was writing was supposed to cover uh, 1910, which was you know, the year that San Juan was incorporated as a city, to 2010. And that's when we were going to unveil the book. So it was supposed to cover a 100 year history. But this history of the Jackson family and the Weber family in the region uh, that were mixed race families that arrived prior to the uh, US Civil War and uh, have you know, uh, family folklore and, and other um, historical documents show that this, these two families participated in assisting runaway slaves across the river into freedom in Mexico. Um, these two historians that I, I, I had been working with and learning a lot from uh, were trying to uh, inspire me or pinch me along the way, say, hey, you really need to, you really need to study this uh, and, and uncover as much as you can because it's a very unique and special history. And so even though it didn't fit within the years of what I was presenting for the history of San Juan in, in this particular book, it did intrigue me. And so ever since then, uh, I have been looking into this history. And when uh, the CHAPS program at UTRGV initiated our Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail project, uh, Dr. Russell Skoranek, who is the founding director of the CHAPS program, said to me, you know, Roseanne, you are studying this very unique history uh, of the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. These are local stories that, you know, people, people want to learn about, and people want to hear about. So we want to highlight this research for our Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail project. And uh, so he has been pushing me further ever since we initiated this uh, Civil War Trail project uh, through the CHAPS program. Uh, we started that in 2013. We started to get the balls rolling in uh, getting the, the program off the ground. And then we actually launched it in 2015. So um, I've been studying this since 2009, at least. And um, it's been um, a very, very interesting journey for me ever since I, ever since I started. I've learned so much uh, and met so many great people throughout the process. Um, in, in, in speaking to that, what would you say was like most, um, you know, an incredible thing you learned, like the thing that stands out to you, like, oh, I had no idea or really stood out or a story that stood out to you that you came across? Well, I, I think the fact that here in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, where we we identify ourselves as the majority Hispanic as a population, uh, not many people realize that we have areas with African roots. And so these two particular families, uh, the Jackson and the Weber families, uh, came here in the 1850s as family units. And they were comprised of a white man and his African-American emancipated slave and or common law wife, and then their mixed race children. And these two families were living as family units during a period of time in our U.S. history where that was not necessarily um, looked upon favorably. And so they were not afraid to do that. And uh, they came to the border, uh, most likely with intentions of crossing the river and living free in Mexico, even though they were already technically free. 
But um, to arrive on this international border where um, at that period of time, it was, it was definitely more, um, people here were more interested in how they could survive economically, less concerned about the color of one's skin. So uh, the, both of these families decided to stay on the US side of the border where they could buy property and uh, live uh, as the, within their family units uh, in peace and harmony and uh, to you know, be in a place that wasn't very heavily populated and just mind their own business and, and go on their way, be, uh, be, go about their business without fear. And so um, what is so striking about these two families during that period of time, like I said, um, it was still, you know, slavery was still the law of the land in many states. It was not looked very kindly upon to have mixed race unions, yet these families were honoring that. John Weber had come to Austin's colony in 1826 from the East Coast and was granted a piece of land within that uh, colony that was named at the time Weber's Prairie. And he embarked into a, you know, relationship with a neighbor slave that resulted in a child and then eventually resulted in two more children. But this man was honorable enough to want to purchase the freedom of Sylvia Hector. The name of the woman is Sylvia Hector. And then their first three children together. And so they, after they were successful in getting her freedom, uh, they married. It is documented that they did marry. Now, you know, this is before Texas became a state in the United States, and this is before Texas became a Confederate state. So in Mexico, interracial marriage was allowed, so the Webbers were allowed to get married because technically Austin's colony was still in Mexico in 1834 when they got married. Uh, they went on to live, continue to live in Weber's Prairie and have many more children and uh, somewhat be accepted in their community. But of course, there were many uh, obstacles and opponents to their union. And as population grew, uh, it got more difficult for them to stay in Weber's Prairie. And, uh, you know, Weber, the, the Webers wanted their children to be educated and all of the new uh, residents in the region were not interested in allowing their, these mixed race children to attend school. So John and Sylvia had to bring in a tutor to come live with them in their home to, to teach their children and educate their children. Um, but they, uh, they decided to leave. Uh, I have a colleague who's doing some research and uh, uh, revealing um, one of the reasons why they left town. So I, I'll, I'll let her talk about that. I'm, I'm not one to steal a colleague's thunder, but um, this was during um, the early 1850s when the Fugitive Slave Act was reenacted in 1850. And all of these new uh, residents of Austin's colony in the region just wanted them gone. And so they headed for the border and uh, they stopped short of going into Mexico and uh, John Weber purchased 8,856 acres of land or otherwise known as two leagues of land uh, in what we know today as Donna and Alamo. 
And so um, there they stayed, they had their family with them and um, they were uh, living uh, subsistence type of uh, farming and taking and ranching and they, you know, they registered their own cattle brands and they uh, licensed a ferry, a ferry landing, a public ferry landing on their property so that they could trade with uh, steamboats going up and down the Rio Grande and they could, they could sell their, their farming products and their hides and things like that. And so um, that is what's remarkable about these families. The Jacksons did the same thing when they came down a few years later in 1857 and bought 5,535 acres uh, about four miles to the west of where the Webbers settled. And so what's remarkable about these families is that they stayed together and honored their relationship as couple, as a couple, and as a family unit, and um, they immediately assimilated into Tejano culture, uh, learning to speak the language and changing their names so that it was reflective of the, their community. Oh, thank you. Um, that's a really good, <laughs> succinct history. Thanks, Steve. Um, one last question for you. Um, since you know you've been involved in this, you know, putting bring the, bringing this to light, like. What, do you, what would you say is, is the importance for our nation and also for the local community about knowing history like this? Well, what's, what's wonderful about this history is that over the years, um, perhaps you had mentioned to me in a previous conversation how sometimes people were not interested in bringing this type of information to light because of racial issues mm -hmm. and maybe not being um, happy that they have African-American roots. And when you go back to the 50s and the 60s when you had civil rights unrest across the nation and you had issues that, um, you know, caused people to have black marks on their families if they had you know, African-American roots, for example, that was decades ago. And so as this history laid silent for many years and now is being brought out to the forefront again, and we have national interest in this story, I have been interviewed by the New York, uh, a, a, a journalist from New York City, from the LA Times, from the Washington Post. I've been interviewed by uh, various NPR radio stations um, in New York City, in Houston, and in Austin, uh, BBC The World in London, uh, you know, Channel 22 in Mexico City. There's been a lot of um, local, state, national, and international interest in this. Um, and as I continue the research, uh, I, I'm now meeting more and more of these family members who, um, who didn't know about their family history, or, or some of them may have known a little bit about it, but they just didn't talk about it in the family. Some of them didn't know anything at all and just were really intrigued with it. But the great thing about it is, is that so many of these family members are so thankful to be able to have learned this, this unique knowledge about their family, about their family's role in this part of our US history. And the fact that you know, these families were helpful and facilitating and kind and caring and giving. And th that makes these family members really proud of their heritage, their special and unique heritage, uh, unique to this region of, of Texas, uh, unique to the Rio Grande Valley, unique to um, the country. 
and in, in, in internationally as well. So what is really nice and rewarding uh, is to see how proud these family members are of their heritage and of their ancestors and, and the role their, ancestor play, their ancestors played in this very special history. And so the United States uh, government back in, uh, or the Congress back in the late 1980s had um, designated a Network to Freedom Trail uh, that right now, if you were to look it up on the National Park Service, you'd see most of those sites on their Network to Freedom Trail are going north into northern states like New York and Ohio and, and then crossing the northern border into Canada. Uh, but recently, uh, because of all of this new knowledge or resurrected knowledge or more interest in the travel south through Texas and into Mexico, into freedom in Mexico, um, we are going to be putting more and more sites on this Network to Freedom Trail that are going south into Mexico. So it is my hope and, and goal uh, as a researcher of this very special and unique history to put the Weber Ranch and the Jackson Ranch on the Network to Freedom Trail uh, eventually, hopefully sometime in the future, uh, so that more and more attention can be brought to these uh, very special families and, and their place in our community. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for listening to Roseanne, our interview with Roseanne Baca Garza. We found it very informational. I found out a lot of things that I didn't know before we interviewed her. So I hope you also learned something. If you want to know more about this subject matter, I suggest going to CHAPS, the CHAPS program um, website with UTRGV. If you want to see a video, they also have produced a video. On, it's available on YouTube called Just a Fairy Ride to Freedom. And we also have more topics to come on civil rights that Juan will mention. Yeah, we're, we're looking to make this a, a longer series. We, um, I know we just did like a two-part episode on wrestling, and we want to do a, a four- to five-part episode covering topics such as the Ed Couch Elsa walkouts, um, the far riots, the Millen strike in Stark County where they marched all the way to Austin, and topics like that. So we look forward to bringing you a lot more Valley history real soon. And, you know, thank you for listening and spread the word, share, comment, and, you know, maybe send us some ideas. Until next time, we, we love, love you, RGV. RGV.